Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Emily Erickson, an associate professor of sociology at Yale University. She conducts research in the fields of social networks, comparative historical sociology, organizations, theory, and economic sociology. Her focus is on the role of social networks in historical and cultural change. Today, we'll talk with Professor Erickson about her new book, Between Monopoly and Free Trade, the English East India Company, 1600 to 1757, which was the recipient of the Macmillan Center's 2016 Gaddis Smith International Book Prize for Best First Book. Welcome, Professor Erickson. Thanks so much for having me. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Well, the book is about the English East India Company. The English East India Company was a crown charter monopoly. So it was granted uh, monopoly privileges to exclusive trade, in fact, by Queen Elizabeth mm -hmm. in 1601, uh, to all of the trade east of the Cape of Good Hope and west of Cape Horn. Uh, it went over to the east in search of spices, coffee, tea, cotton, um, and it was a commercial operation until about 1833, or a monopoly commercial operation, at which time it, it transferred into a, the foundation of the colonial empire, or the British colonial empire in Asia. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I don't focus on the incipient colonialism as much as I do on the commercial aspects. And what I found really compelling about the East India Company was that it allowed its employees to engage in a private trade. Mm -hmm. So the employees traded, they, they had their own trading operations that they engaged in, in their own self-interest that was outside of, of the company's interests. Mm -hmm. So it's as if you were working at a restaurant and you, and you were the waitress, but you sold drinks to the customers mm -hmm. uh, and, and you profited from that rather than the, than the restaurant itself. So it's an unusual, unusual situation. It is, it is. And what, what sparked your interest in this? What led you to write the book? Oh, uh, the, the, the first thing that, well, the private trade, of course, was compelling, but I was really interested in this sort of age of encounters between Asia and Europe. Mm -hmm. I came out of a history degree at UC Berkeley where I was introduced to this incredible book called The Islands of History by Marshall Sollins. And that was about Captain Cook's voyages to Fiji, um, Hawaii, and New Zealand. And it's also sort of about the way that encounters between different societies can transform the social structures of those societies. Okay. And I, I just became very interested in, in thinking about how these events uh, could have impacted the societies and civilizations in the East and the West. Okay, so let's talk about um, about the employee networks and why do you think the company allowed their employees to do such a thing? And also, were they selling the company's goods? How did that work? Or it was their own goods that they were selling? Talk a little bit about that. Oh, sure. So essentially, the company. So this was difficult. Um, uh, they, they, it was difficult conditions, right? So the uh, the employ I mean, they're, they're traveling. It takes six months at least to get to Asia. Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, you have to live on a boat. You're not with your family. Scurvy was not oh, under control. I'm sure People were, were dying at this incredible rate. So it's a 33 percent mortality rate for oh employees. My goodness. If you can imagine a company like that nowadays, wouldn't get very far. Uh, but so they uh, had to offer inducements to the employees and, and the company, the English company, didn't, it was not in, in fact all that wealthy or powerful when it began. So the inducement that they could offer was that they would allow the employees to engage in this private mm -hmm. trade. And the private trade was entirely funded by the, the capital of, of the employees, the, the captains, the officers, and, and, and the seamen to a very small extent uh, because of course you had to have capital. but. So they supplied their own capital, their own goods. Um, and what were the goods? What were well, they selling? Well, often it was liquor. So Iraq, a, a kind of a liquor. There was um, mechanical trinkets were very popular. Mm -hmm. And um, well, often also jewels, right? And jewels are attractive to people because there's a lot of wealth in a mm -hmm. compact form. Right. So th those were the central commodities. Okay, interesting. So mm -hmm. how did you do the, the research for the book? I mean, how did you go about finding out about this kind of stuff? 
Oh, well, um, so the research, so what I did, that what was different that I did in this book was I used network analysis to illuminate the informal patterns of communication between employees. Mm -hmm. So in order to do network analysis, you have to get systematic data. It, it, that, that's what was difficult uh, about that, uh, okay. or about the, the research process, was I had to find some kind of systematic data about an encounters between these European and, and Asian markets. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I did essentially was I just combed the stacks. I was at Columbia in graduate school, so I combed mm -hmm. the stacks at Butler Library until I found these incredible volumes, and it was sort of like a gold mine. Um, they were uh, a record of all of a record of the logs of the journeys of the voyages of the English East India Company East India Men ships. Okay. So once I got that, and then there was a record of all of the officers' careers also. Mm -hmm. So once I got that, then uh, I. I had to convert it into electronic format. Okay. This is something that is so commonplace now, but 10 years ago it was actually a pretty cumbersome process. Mm -hmm. what, was the pro what, what was the process? What did you have to do? I had to scan all of the pages, convert it. This was, this was actually right when converting PDF to text mm -hmm. was just being sort of ah, invented. Okay. Right? It, would have just, it was really new technology. Um, and so I converted it to text, and then I actually I learned to program so that I could reorganize all of the data, although it still took so many, so many, I mean months of cleaning, mm -hmm. sadly. But wow. it's much faster now, you know, yeah. it's, it's much easier to engage in this kind of research now. So how did the English East India Company become one of the most prominent and enduring organizations in history? Well, it, it's a great question. It's an Im important question because it, it sort of flies in the face of what we think uh, is important about organizations in general. So in mm -hmm. sociology, often um, it's sort of a Weberian, Max Weber legacy to think of organizations as all about hierarchical control. Mm -hmm. But in this case, and this is really one of the most important earliest companies um, in history, it wasn't about hierarchical control. It was essentially about seeding power and autonomy to the employees. Mm -hmm. So they, they essentially profit shared by ceding the exclusive privileges that had been granted to the company to the employees. They gave the employees all this autonomy to engage in this private trade and that translated into informal collaboration between the employees. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's profit sharing autonomy and, and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that also helped the bottom line for the um, uh, the English East India Company itself, um, because they had a, many employees out in the world, you know, doing business basically. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, th those patterns of of, uh, of behavior they they produced the success of the English East India Company. They made it competitive compared to the other firms mm -hmm. because drawing on the innovative capacity of the employees and, and the way that they distributed information throughout the company, the firm itself became more flexible mm -hmm. a and it was able to adapt to what were really volatile market conditions mm -hmm. in overseas trade at that time. Did you look at any of the people who, who were at the top, who were heading the company and any history about them? Oh, well, the people that were heading the company were so interested. They were all against the private trade, of course, because they wanted to get as much as, as they could mm -hmm. out of their exclusive pr the, right. the privileges. Uh, but they, in s they, they, they couldn't help in order to keep the company moving. They couldn't help but grant the, the privileges to the employees. But they were Very all against it. So oh, it that's was, interesting. It was an unintended consequence. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. so another um, outcome of this is um, it really expanded the trade between Europe and Asia. Can you talk a little bit about what you found there as well? Oh, sure. And that's another really great question because it uh, reveals something. I mean, the reason that the English East India Company became a dominant force in trade between Asia and Europe is really because of the sophisticated markets that existed in Asia before, mm -hmm. uh, before the English East India Company went there or, or before any of these large chartered European companies. So especially the private trade really depended upon pre-existing merchant networks and the availability of small capital loans. Mm -hmm. So essentially what they needed were open markets with, with pretty sophisticated financial techniques. Okay. Uh, and, and those were, were 
to be found in spades across Asia, which uh -huh. was a very developed, rich, sophisticated commercial world. So it was really the sophistication and complexity of the markets in Asia that supported the success of the English East India Company over time and allowed it to become such, such uh, an important figure in this overseas trade. Okay. Um, and what do you conclude in your book? Uh, so I, I think there's there's a number of conclusions, but I, the the ultimate conclusion that I want to emphasize mm -hmm. is that it, re, it was the informal patterns of collaboration between the company that that per, uh, between the company employees that produced the success of the company. Mm -hmm. So what you can pull out from that that I think is fascinating is that social networks, social networks that we think of as sort of interpersonal communication, can actually have these huge impacts on the course of human history. Mm -hmm. So in this case, they influence through the success of the company the trajectory of global trade and politics for centuries. I mean, you can argue that it affected the trajectory of, of global trade and politics until Brexit and the end of, of you know, British hegemony. Uh, so, um, so these little things accumulate mm -hmm. up into big outcomes. Right, right. Interesting. Um, so your book is out now. Yes. And I know you're working on a new project. Tell us about it. Oh, so my new project, I'm very excited about it. It's about the development of economic thought in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of evidence that shows that it's actually very closely tied to the rise of chartered companies at the same time, mm -hmm. of which the English East India Company was one of these chartered companies. So are you looking all over the world globally, or are you focused uh, on, on basically the, the colonial empire? Oh, yeah. Um, I am focused, it's mostly, so economic thought is mostly an English phenomenon okay. at this time. So I do a little bit of a comparative cases, especially with the Dutch Republic, mm -hmm. because you'd think that the Dutch were a little more advanced than mm -hmm. the English at that time. You would think they would have produced economic uh, thought, but they, they didn't make oh. any significant contributions. Interesting. And they also didn't really have the same number of companies. Um, they not it was not as widespread in the Netherlands, which I think is is really one of the keys to to this sort of puzzle. Right, right. Well, we will look forward to that uh, book coming out in the near future. Thanks so much. And Thank it's you. been great to have you. It's been great to be here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. For more information about Professor Erickson and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.